Welcome to Equal Opportunities Committee. It's the 11th meeting of 2015. Please set any electronic devices to flight mode or off, please. I'd like to start with introductions. We are supported at the table by the clerk and research staff, official reporters and broadcasting services, and around the room by the security office. My name is Margaret McCulloch and I'm the committee's convener. Our members will now introduce themselves in turn, starting here on my right. Good uh, morning. Uh, Sandra White, MSP for Glasgow Kelvin, Deputy Convener. Good morning, Annabel Gold, the MSP for the West of Scotland. Good morning, John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. Good morning, Christian Arad, MSP for North East of Scotland. Uh, John Mason, MSP for Glasgow Shettleston. And I'm Jane Baxter, MSP for Mid Scotland and Fife. Agenda item one. The first agenda item today is a decision on taking business in private. You're asked to agree consideration of evidence heard during today's meeting at item three in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Agenda item two is an evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights of our inquiry into age and social isolation. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary and his accompanying official. And can I start by asking you and your official to introduce yourselves and invite you, Cabinet Secretary, to make any opening remarks. Hey, Alec Neal, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights. Hey, Trevor Owen, um, Human Rights Policy Manager, Equality, Human Rights and Third Sector Division. Um, we've actually been taking quite a lot of evidence um, from various organisations, um, hearing about the impact social isolation and loneliness can actually have on younger people and older people. Sorry, Cabinet Secretary, I thought I should have asked you, do you want to make any open remarks or I assume by just your introduction you weren't going to? Very briefly, if that's yeah, okay, convener. Okay, yeah. thank you. Can I first of all say I welcome the opportunity to discuss this issue, a very important issue uh, with the committee. And I think we probably can all agree there are no easy answers to the challenges in terms of social isolation and loneliness. And we're talking about a very fundamental societal issue and we're committed, we're all committed, I think, to exploring what more we can do to tackle the issue uh, which affects a lot of people in Scotland, although I think it is difficult to precisely quantify at any one time how many people are actually affected. Uh, and I think, obviously, this strikes at uh, our hearts as well, because no doubt we all know someone who at some point has suffered from isolation uh, or from loneliness. Um, and clearly... Um, all the answers can't be from, from government. Very often this is about interpersonal relationships and things that are well out of the control and the remit uh, of the government. However, I do believe that it's important for us to do what we can because uh, isolation and loneliness can lead to other problems, not least health problems, both mental health and indeed physical health problems. So we believe there's a strong moral case for tackling a loneliness and social uh, isolation and there's clear evidence to suggest that an unwanted lack of social contact can contribute to poorer outcomes for individuals across the board as I've already said poorer health shorter lifespan bad lifestyle choices can often lead where someone experiences long-term social isolation to tackle this, we believe we need a holistic approach, whether it be through lifting people out of poverty, through ensuring that housing in place supports uh, the uh, individual in independent living, making sure our schools and communities are the best place to grow up, delivering accessible transport and ensuring that people have access to fair and equitable work. Success will inevitably be measured by the improvement of the quality of lives for individuals, their feelings of connection to society and their ability to create these connections for themselves. Wider public services play a critical role. When services come into contact with somebody suffering from social isolation, it is imperative, we believe, to get better at recognising the signs and stand ready to help. The third sector is often the route into reaching those who may be invisible to services, and that's why we continue to invest in that sector and work to integrate it into how we plan and deliver public services. We fund a range of projects to both children and young people and older people that contribute to tackling loneliness and social isolation in these groups. And I'll be visiting the McMerry Men's Shed today, which happily celebrates its second birthday. Uh, we've established a partnership with Age Scotland to develop further the network of men's sheds in Scotland. 
members will have heard of these community-led initiatives which bring together older men, often either social is socially isolated or with long-term health conditions, to engage in activity within a community space. I've been told that these projects have made a critical difference to the quality of these men's lives and I look forward to seeing this afternoon that for myself. So I, that's just a brief introduction, a convener, to give maximum time to the committee to make comment and, and ask questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, when you're talking about the third sector, do you think um, the third sector and other service providers in the health and social work and housing really fully understand and appreciate the, the impact that social isolation and loneliness can have on these groups of people? I think it's very varied. Uh, if I can take, for example, the social care sector, I do believe there is very clear evidence, um, difficult to quantify, but people working in the social care sector who are uh, visiting older people in particular on a daily basis are usually very good at identifying where there is isolation or where there is loneliness and indeed doing something about it. And I think there's clear evidence that a lot of social care agencies, both in the public sector and in the third sector, are very good at picking that up and doing something about it. Um, but there are other sectors, obviously, where that's not necessarily the case. Uh, and I think it's a very, very varied picture we have across the country. And clearly, um, this, this affliction can affect anybody of any age in any circumstance, uh, of any social or economic status. And therefore, because by definition, if people are isolated and not mixing in the wider community, then by definition, it's going to be difficult very often to identify who those people are and to be able to help them. Um, very briefly, what do you think you as Cabinet Secretary and also the Scottish Government can actually do to raise this awareness and also reach people who are socially isolated and lonely, lonely and not to feel ashamed to say that they are in this particular situation at that point in time and actually reach out and ask for help? Well, both in my previous position as Health and Wellbeing Secretary and my current position as Social Justice Secretary with a special responsibility for community and pensioners' rights, I think we are much more aware of this as a problem we need to do something about than we were even five years ago. Uh, to give an example, um, dementia is very often spoken about as the biggest challenge of our age in terms of older people. And it's a huge challenge. I don't think uh, anyone here would uh, want to underestimate the size of the scale of the challenge. But actually, depression amongst older people is a far, far bigger problem than dementia. Far more older people suffer from depression than suffer from dementia. And therefore, I believe, particularly in pursuing a preventive strategy, uh, because there's clear evidence medically that depression can be caused or in part or in whole from social isolation and loneliness. And therefore, if we're going to follow a preventive strategy, we need to do much more to stop people being isolated and lonely. And I know one of the things we do in the health service um, and obviously in social care and in other services more and more is actually fund, if you like, non-medication -medic type solutions. I mean, I, I remember a few months ago when I was still the health secretary visiting a deep end practice, a GP practice in the east end of Glasgow and talking to the patients. And there was, for example, one lady in particular who had suffered from depression. She had come back to Glasgow to look after her ailing mother. Her mother had died. She had no friends because she'd been out of Glasgow for 40 years. Um, she was on benefit because she uh, had to look after her mother. She couldn't find a job even when her mother died. And she was extremely isolated. Her sister worked abroad, so she didn't have any contact on a daily basis with her. And she had been attending the doctor for depression, largely caused, caused in the doctor's opinion, by this social isolation uh, and the circumstances in which she found herself. Now, she was very fond of animals. And actually... What the doctor did was he put her in touch with uh, an organisation that looks after uh, animals that have been abandoned. And actually, her health began to improve almost immediately because she was doing something that she enjoyed. She felt valued. She was meeting new friends, making new contacts and get into a social network that 
you know, she hadn't been in before. And I thought that was a very, very good example of where so-called social prescribing is as important as medication. Um, and t to be quite frank, also, uh, it's, it's, I think it's more effective um, as well. Uh, and it's more cost effective, actually, as well. And I think that was a very, very good example of where new ways and thinking out the box has to be done right across, not just in health, but right across our public services. Thank you. We will be coming along to that shortly by um, one of the other members will be asking you in detail about that. But we'll move on just now to John Mason. Thanks, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I mean, you already used the phrase, I like the phrase, a fundamental societal issue. And, uh, you know, I'm really wondering, is this some, is, can we measure isolation and loneliness? Or, I mean, you can measure broken legs because that's yes. pretty obvious. You can maybe measure dementia, I think. But is this something we can measure? Because measuring things is helpful in targeting. Yes. I, I, I'm going to give you a yes and no to that, John. I, I do think there are examples of where we clearly can measure it. For example, in the exa example I've just quoted very clearly um, the, in the doctor's notes, it is very clearly down that that lady, her depression uh, was in large part caused by isol social isolation and loneliness. Um, so she will be down in, she is down in his notes in terms of that being recorded. But I think one of the things we've got to recognise is sometimes it's a condition that's very transient. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, someone, a young person leaving school, leaving the parental home and going to university in another town there's very clear evidence from the university health sector that sometimes these uh, young people suffer from social isolation uh, and loneliness because you know they, they find it difficult to mix in the new environment in which they find themselves. But very often that's in the initial stages in the first year or maybe even the second year. And once they get into the swing of things, very often it kind of cures, if I can use that phrase, itself. Uh, similarly, I think when older people, in particular, where there's been partner, they've been partners together, a married couple, say, for a long time, uh, even if there's a big family involved, very often the person who's left, the spouse who's left, uh, will go through a period of feeling very lonely. They might be totally surrounded by their family and by friends, but they can't help feeling lonely because the person they spend most of their time with and the person they love the most is no longer with them and isn't coming back. So I don't think it's something that you can measure uh, very accurately if you were looking for a total measurement. I think there are areas where we can identify the problem much more easily and, and measure the problem much more easily than we can in other areas. Um, and I, I, I think where we can measure, we should measure it, and we should also, more importantly, look at what, uh, is effective in dealing with it and helping people who are suffering from isolation and loneliness. So when it comes to the, the kind of targeting then... I mean, do, do we accept, and I would totally agree with you, that in some cases it, it does kind of cure itself, a young person just gets to know people over time and, that, and that's OK, so we probably don't need to do anything about that. Um, but, um, I mean, should we therefore be concentrating on the kind of longer-term ones, the, the, the example you've given with the women and the animals... And, and seeking to put our resources in there? No, I, not necessarily, because again, if I can go back to my period at health, um, some of these young people don't cure themselves. And indeed, you know, the, the incidence of suicide amongst young people in Scotland mm. is still a major cause for concern. We've got one of the highest uh, suicide rates amongst young people in the whole of the U European Union. And some of that, I think, is due to loneliness and social isolation. So um, you don't know who is going to end up um, suicidal as a result of that and therefore my belief is that we should be doing everything we can because we don't know if it's going to be temporary or mm -hmm, permanent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and it's not a risk I don't think you could take so if you come across somebody like a young person who's just moved into a university or college situation uh, that I've described of the kind I've described and, and they are lonely and isolated I don't I think we should do everything we possibly can to help them get out of that situation. No, fair enough. And, I mean, how do you see the government's role in that uh, as against, you know, all the other organisations? Because there's councils out there, there's the yeah. GPs, the rest of the health service. In some areas, there's some very good third sector stuff. We've been in Easter House, we've been in Isla. Yeah. Um, 
you know, is, is, is the government's role to kind of support all these organisations or how, how do you see the government? Well, first of all, I think probably we're getting to the stage where we actually need a fairly wide ranging strategy uh, at a national level. And hopefully once the committee reports, that's something we could look at uh, jointly. Because I think if we had an overarching strategy that covered a whole range of services um, and what we do about it, I also think probably we need a bit of a research programme to find out more about the incidents, the typical profile of people who are most at risk and so on and so forth. So I think there's a lot of work still to be done and our job at the moment, I think, is to um, do that research, uh, to look at what works, what doesn't work, to enable organisations such as universities to provide the support that's necessary, uh, to organisations in social care to provide support for the disabled people and for older people who may be um, subject to this kind of condition, uh, loneliness and so on. You know, I think our job is in enabling and making sure that people are aware of it, you know, that kind of role. But I do think it's very much down to individual circumstances. Um, and uh, I don't think you can issue a prescription on, on how we can uh, identify this in every single circumstance throughout every uh, possible situation in society. So I think the role of the government is about awareness, it's about research, it's about enabling, it's about having a strategy in place and getting the public sector and the third sector and other organisations behind it. It should cover health, it should cover education, it should cover transport and a whole range of other things. And I think that would be a good starting point. I mean, that's, that's very positive, and I, I like the idea of a strategy, and I like the idea of research. I mean, one of the things that's been suggested to us, and you have already touched on this, actually, is that there are certain groups that may be particularly vulnerable, and older men is one, and the men's sheds, we've had evidence about that, and uh, that sounds very positive. I mean, others would be LGBT folk yep. as they yep. get older, um, sometimes minority ethnic communities. Yep. And I mean, it interests me too that, you know, somebody from a minority ethnic community or any of these other groups, they might have friends within their own circle, but they might have no friends, you know, from another ethnic yes. uh, group. And I, I mean, I'm not even sure, does that matter? Or as long as people have some friends, or do we want, does it matter that people have a wider range, do you think? Well, I, 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 I personally think it does. I mean, you know, if you take the rural communities, for example, um, if you are a member of the ethnic community in a very small community, sometimes that can be a lonely position to be in. Uh, if you're a member of the LGBTI community in a rural community, that can be a lonely place to be in. Um, so, you know, if, but if you're living in the in the towns, it might be a lot less lonely because there are many other people, you know, in similar circumstances to yourself. There are networks in towns and cities that don't necessarily exist or are very difficult to access from a rural community. Similarly, if you're a widow or widower, living in a rural community um, and there aren't many kind of communal activities, that can be a very lonely place to be as well. So I think, you know, you can describe a million different circumstances and scenarios and that's why it's not going to be an easy problem to tackle because uh, it's it could happen to any one of us, literally, to anybody of any age, of any social or economic status in any part of Scotland, you know, at any time. It could be transient, it could be temporary, it could be permanent. We just don't know. It affects every single one of us. So I don't think there's any silver bullet here uh, at all. One final little question based on what you just said. Do you think there is more of a problem in rural areas? or I think there, can, there can be in uh -huh. certain circumstances. I mean, I, I remember um, myself, I, I had two sets of grandparents and I was very close to both of them. And they both actually lived in rural communities. But in one of the rural communities, it was very well organised. There was bus trips and, and all that kind of thing. And they got a, you know, a, a box of uh, things at Christmas was delivered to every pensioner in the village and all that kind of thing. There's a lot of social activity going on. And yet in the other rural community where my other sets of grandparents were living, none of that happened. You know, because it tended to be an area where there was a lot of second homes and people just visited, you know, um, and, and there wasn't the level of activity. Uh, so there, there was two different rural communities. One where it was almost impossible to feel lonely because of the amount of activity that was going on. And in the other, the other extreme where nothing was going on. 
uh, to to help older people to mix and you know to have trips and all the rest of it. So uh, I don't think you can categorise particularly. I think it's very much individual circumstances. Sandra would like to yeah, come in now. I'd just like to come in on the, the back of uh, the beginning of John's questions in regard to measuring loneliness and yes. social isolation. And you, obviously you'd mentioned yourself, Cabinet Secretary, about raising awareness. Uh, obviously before you can measure, you need to raise awareness and you need to find out exactly what is loneliness in that respect. I just wondered if um, a national campaign to raise awareness would be something that perhaps the Scottish Government might look at. Uh, we were talking about, you know, dementia and you've got the See Me campaign for mental health. Would it be something that would be you'd be looking at if you're talking about research that would actually raise... Because there's all different forms of loneliness, obviously, but some people are not aware that maybe their next-door neighbour is lonely. So I just wondered if it was something the Scottish Government might think of looking at. Absolutely. I don't see why not, because, you know, it's the type of thing we need to make more people aware of, and mm. it might be a simple case of just checking on your neighbour. Uh, we tend to do these things around Christmas mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that people aren't left, you know, on Christmas Day. Um, and I don't see why... You know, it's not, it's not just a problem at Christmas, loneliness. Yeah. It's a problem for all year round. And therefore, uh, doing something, you know, uh, more um, consistent and, and longer term uh, and at different times of the year, mm -hmm. I think, is something we should look at. And obviously, if the committee wanted to make recommendations, we would take those mm -hmm. very Thank seriously. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, moving on now to Annabel. <coughs> Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, we've been very interested in an area which is described as social prescribing, and you yourself yes. gave a very interesting illustration of how that can work, which you encountered in Glasgow. And the uh, Royal College of GPs produced a report which was very positive about the benefits of employing linked workers in GP practices, and that was following the government-funded programme yep. um, uh, to look into that. And I don't want to draw you into anxious questions about cost and resource, but I'm interested whether you think this concept, which for many people is new, of social prescribing, do you think the scope to place that in a more formal footing? I'm not talking just now about how yes. you do it, or I'm talking about getting that concept right out there on the radar screen. I, I actually think there's an opportunity at the present time with the new health and social care partnerships writing their business plans and their strategies to build this in as part of the preventive strategy, uh, because I absolutely think this is, on, on scale, this is a big problem, and I do think that if uh, we did more, and actually... You know, in, in the great scheme of things, the, the cost of funding maybe lunch clubs, for example, uh, for older people, is pretty negligible uh, compared to the cost of having to treat people, say, for depression. Uh, so as part of the preventive strategy, I, when I was health secretary, and I know my successor is doing the same, it, I was encouraging, you know, boards to use some of their funds to do this kind of social prescribing type activity. It might not be social prescribing in the sense of pres a prescription for an individual. It might be done at a more of a community level. I think both are relevant. The kind <coughs> of uh, social prescribing that described for the lady who um, was fond of animals is appropriate and clearly worked. Uh, but also in terms of prevention, if we can make sure that the funds are there to encourage a communal activity, uh, if I can put it that way. I think that's definitely worthwhile doing. Let me say, I actually think one of the most effective uh, things that we've all done and supported in this parliament is the bus pass. Uh, you know, the, the value of the bus pass isn't just the fact that you're getting a concessionary fare. It actually encourages older people to go out and visit friends, visit shops, visit relatives, even at a distance, uh, which, quite frankly, they wouldn't do if they didn't have a pass. If we, if we abolished the bus pass and added the money to the pension, actually, I think that would be a retrograde state because I think the bus pass actually plays a big role that we've never tried to quantify. We've never thought of it in that way, but I think there's clear evidence anecdotally that the bus pass is one way in which older people are incentivised to get out and about, which wouldn't be the case otherwise. And I thank you, and I think we're all very encouraged by your response, Cabinet Secretary. I mean, 
trying to tease out, if, if we accept the concept of social prescribing as a very positive one, yeah. what struck me about your own example was that was made possible by the existing structure, yes. by a GP, yeah. who knew where there was something that might appeal to his patient and helper, and he was able to refer. We, we did take evidence from... Um, uh, the medical profession, who were very anxious about the expense implications of um, extending the practical implement of social prescribing. But I'd be interested in your views. Do you think if we, if we get acknowledged that this is a very sound positive concept, there's actually a lot that can be done within existing structures, and it's a question of changing culture of how people think? Yeah. Absolutely, and I think the GPs have a critical role to play because they um, very often are in touch with the people. Um, I mean, 50% of the Scottish population is under the care of the National Health Service at any one point in time, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and 90% and of that is under the GP's care. So the GP's are in an ideal position uh, to make inroads into dealing with this problem. And if I can again quote the example, you know, we shouldn't always generalise from one ex example, but actually uh, by prescribing, um, and it was through the link worker, it was organised in the deep end practice, but by getting that lady involved in an organisation that looked after animals, uh, gradually she was coming off their depression pills as she get better. It saved the health service money, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it, it wasn't done for these reasons, but it was mm -hmm. cheaper, you know, because it didn't cost the health service anything uh, other than, you know, uh, an hour of the link worker's time to organise that. Once it was organised, you know, the GP's practice didn't need to be any f involved any further in terms of uh, the aspect of her activity with the, the dog people, or the, the, the animal uh, charity people. And by coming off antidepressants and all the rest of it, she felt a lot better and it, it was actually cheaper for the health service because the GP no longer had to prescribe the same level of medication as he was doing previously. Mm -hmm. And the objective, of course, was to get her off antidepressants entirely. Now, again, I think that's very <coughs> encouraging. And I think my next question then is, if, if we find the concept positive, if we're aware of how it can be applied at the moment within existing structures, um, is there a better way of making links then between GP practices and what may be available out there in the community. Absolutely, and, and in some of the link workers who were employed in the deep end practices in Glasgow, both collectively and individually, part of their job was to build up a list of all the or local organisations that the GP could use to refer people to. And the GPs who were doing that told me they were absolutely astounded in some of these fairly poor communities just the number of organisations that were uh, on the ground and f to which they could refer their patients if they felt they could benefit from referral to one of these organisations. So that's why we are invested heavily in the link workers and the deep end practices because actually that that is a very good example of the kind of job a link worker can do that a GP is never going to have the time to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think... The final question is going to ask and Vina, the Cabinet <coughs> Secretary has partially answered already, which is using the new integration of, of health and social work yeah. um, and, and these partnerships um, to be imaginative in devising their own strategies yes. to combat social isolation and, and loneliness. I mean, is, again, is this a question of um, helping these new partnerships to understand the potential of what they can do, or do you think there is some bigger role for them to play that would um, th that would require government um, intervention or guidance? Well, I, I think the key to this is, you know, and the key to a lot of things is actually putting much more emphasis and resources into prevention. Um, and mm -hmm. this the, this is where these partnerships could make a huge difference in scale for, relatively speaking, not a great deal of money because this is not particularly expensive to do. Uh, because you know you, you you don't need to fund you know lunch clubs. People contribute to lunch clubs. Mm -hmm. Other organisations come in mm -hmm. and and volunteer. I mean, I don't think we use the volunteering sector enough. This is volunteering week, and you, you know, I, well, let me give you an example. Uh, I was uh, in Govan yesterday, 
um, at talking to community activists in Govan. Uh, and they're doing a fantastic amount of work in the community in central Govan. Uh, because of uh, cutbacks in Glasgow City Council's budget, they lost two uh, mental health workers who had been working with them to help local people address mental health issues in Govan. And I said to them, why don't we look at uh, creating and suggesting this at a Glasgow level probably, a core of retired doctors. I mean, I, I remember when I worked in Eastern Europe, we had SCOA, Scottish core of retired executives, who, for their expenses only, they didn't get paid, just their expenses, they went to Eastern Europe to help people set up new businesses because after communism they didn't know how to do it. Why don't we? The number of pe people who retire from the medical service but would like to give something back on a voluntary basis. If we organised much more cores of retired doctors, retired nurses, retired mental health workers uh, who are willing, I mean, it's not compulsory or anything, but the, a lot of these people themselves live alone. And actually, it's like the men's shed. One of the benefits of the men's shed is the men themselves, as well as delivering a service to the community, the men themselves actually feel as though they're valued and they're part of a network and they're mm -hmm. out and about and all the rest of it. It shouldn't just apply to men, and it shouldn't just apply to men who have got a trade. We could do it with retired mental health workers, retired nurses, retired everything. You know, and I think the voluntary sector uh, could do a lot more here, not to substitute what we should be paying for on a professional basis, but to add additional resource. And it very often helps the volunteers because the volunteers themselves mm -hmm. are just as vulnerable to this kind of social isolation as the rest of us. Thank you, convener. I have really enjoyed that cabinet secretary. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Christian, do you want to ask any questions just now or will we move on to... I, I might ask some yeah. question about uh, the integration of health <coughs> and social services. And we, we had a lot of people coming in uh, cabinet secretary and we went to see a lot of people as well. Where, um, very um, optimistic about this integration of, of services. But as we know, it's a bit patchy. Some areas are doing better than, than, yep. than others. But I, I see a little bit of concern. I know that referral seem, seems to work, but I see a little bit concern that uh, we have not. You know, you said uh, that it should be included in the uh, definition of how in, in, in the preparatory work which has happened and how to draw the plan for this integration services. But is it, do, do we know it, if it has been done? Well, the plans are being, uh, should by now have been submitted to the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing um, and it's an area where I think um, we've just got to together, not just the health service but through local government and so on, just make sure that this kind of strategy, I mean, right across the board, the prevention strategy has to be an absolutely essential ingredient in how we cater with the challenges facing the health and social care sector and indeed wider public services in the future. Prevention is going to be absolutely essential. And what I'm saying, Christian, is that um, as part of the prevention strategy to prevent social isolation and loneliness, um, then the kind of activity uh, that we just, we talked about should be included. Now, it might not, you know, the, these documents are very strategic documents, so they might not go into a lot of detail, but I think a prevention strategy uh, is absolutely essential for all of these new partnerships. And while it might not be detailed in, at this stage, I think very clearly this is the kind of thing they should be looking at because very clearly it works. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking, I, I'm not sure if it's a detail, you know, when we, we had a lot of people in front of us, but yes. what it was it should be maybe at the core. And, and I'm, I'm just a bit concerned about timing yes. because, you know, from, from the 1st of April, it's, it's, been, it's yeah. been delivered already. Yeah. I know some people are going, some authorities are going slower than others, some have bought, I'm a bit slower than others. Yeah. But it, it will be maybe more difficult to get, uh, you know, time, we've got a report, or you, you, you develop that strategy yes. of social isolation. It might be a bit too late. Well, I, I, I mean, the, the, these are the initial strategies, and there's no reason why, you know, they couldn't build in um, future provision, because there's always contingency funding for uh, other things that come along uh, in all of these types of organisations. But 
I, my view is that prevention is absolutely key, and in terms of preventing isolation and loneliness, then the kind of social prescribing type activity, either at a communal level or the individual patient level, is absolutely essential uh, and will will grow as part and parcel of how we deal with the challenges in the health and social care sector. What about uh, talking about the third sector? How much the third sector is involved in that integration of the two, two, two services? Has it been put as an equal partner? Well, the, the two statutory partners are the voting partners on the joint boards, um, but I made it clear, and I know Shona has done as well, that the third sector must have a key role to play. Indeed, all the other stakeholders must have a key role to play, including the users of the services, must have a key role to play in helping to design uh, the services. Uh, now, it, it does vary, and certainly in my time at Health, I got from time to time complaints from the third sector saying they didn't feel as though they were involved enough um, in the drafting of the plan, the business plan and the strategy. And when that, that kind of feedback came to me, I immediately then tried to rectify that because uh, the third sector has got huge experience and huge untapped resource. You know, I've just mentioned the volunteering sector. So all of this is required to deal with the challenges that face us. I'm happy to hear this because you, you took the example of the Manchin movement one time. It's in my hometown. We were very proud to be the first one in, 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 in the UK and I had a little hand in it. And I'll, I'll go to, to, to see them today. But when you're talking about this, this first sector organisation, they are, as you say, users. Yes. You know, they have themselves yes, absolutely. users and services. So how can we make sure that in the integration of the two services, they are right up there at strategic level? Well, the, it's, it's very clear. I mean, in all the guidance that's been issued in this, it, all the guidance very clearly states that the third sector must be involved and must be involved in the design uh, of services uh, as well as other stakeholders. So... The guidance that's there uh, being issued to these new joint boards, all the guidance makes it absolutely clear that that must happen. It'd be great if we could have a caveat of social isolation as well on it, just to, to make yes, sure that, absolutely. that, that I mean, is there at strategic level and doesn't come as an afterthought. Yes, and again, that's maybe the kind of thing the committee might want to make recommendations about. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, over to John Finney now. Uh, morning, Cabinet Secretary. Morning. Some questions about housing, Cabinet Secretary, yes. and, and I know that it's uh, under the heading sheltered housing, which of course can mean different things to different people and isn't exclusively about older people, but it's an opportunity, as people would, most people would understand and from what we've heard, of people remaining in the community. Yes. Um, you mentioned earlier about research, and I, I know a local authority is obliged to do a housing needs analysis. Can you see, are there plans, simply are there plans for the Scottish Government to encourage the building of more um, sheltered housing? Well, ab absolutely. I mean, as you know, John, every local authority is responsible for the housing plan in their area. Uh, and clearly, um, the, uh, when we talk about sheltered housing, I'm going to use that phrase in a very wide interpretation because clearly the the demands and the needs and the aspirations of older people are changing. I mean, I remember a number of years ago where, for example, um, the demand was for one-bedroom sheltered housing. Now it's much more for two-bedroom sheltered housing so the family can come and live uh, or visit because families tend to not live in the same town or nearby always to the older people. So... When we use the term sheltered housing or very sheltered housing, um, I think if we can just treat that as a very wide definition because we've now got very wide different uh, models uh, across the country uh, in terms of shel sheltered housing. Yes. Uh, but it's absolutely essential. Um, and most sheltered and housing for disabled people, I mean, I don't think we're still... Um, in terms of the new build, building enough, particularly in the owner-occupied sector, enough new houses that are catering for disabled people or very disabled people. And design is important. What, what input is there from the Scottish Government to design standards that would, for instance, help design out things that would cause isolation? We know that some well-meaning designs at various stages actually, not just for people feeling isolated, yes. but um, they've created social problems because of the design. Yes. What, what, 
What input is there from the Scottish Government to that? Well, very often I think most of that has come from the the planning side in terms of, you know, these vast housing estates without facilities rather than the specific design of the house. Um, and as you know, we've moved away from these large-scale developments with no facilities. I mean, if you look at Easter House, when Easter House was built, it was built for a population of 50,000 people, the same size as Ayr. Now, Ayr's got a high street, it's got a main street, it's got, in each of the housing schemes, a shopping centre and all the rest of it. And yet Easter House had barely half a dozen shops to start with. So I think we've learned the lessons. I mean, don't get me wrong, the post-war priority was to get people into housing with sanitation, <laughs> basic sanitation and so on. And, you know, it's easy for us to look back and be critical. Uh, but I think we've learned the lessons of going for these massive housing schemes with no facilities. Um, and, you know, in terms of that design, uh, I think the lessons have been well learned. And certainly all the guidance that we issue in, in terms of our funding for new uh, start, uh, new build, um, is very much geared to uh, making sure the facilities are there. Uh, and indeed, not just facilities in terms of shopping, but one of the big challenges, and you know, in Aberdeen, for example, uh, this has been a particular problem where new, big new housing developments uh, have not built in um, medical facilities and GP facilities. And one of the things we've been looking at, both from a local government point of view and a health point of view, Shona Robinson and I, is how in future do we make sure that the health facilities are built in you know, very often Section 75 agreements are about schools or about community mm -hmm. facilities, but they're not very often about health services, and yet the health service is absolutely critical uh, to provision. Mm. Uh, sorry, John. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, John. Uh, could I ask the, the, the Cabinet Secretary a very quick question in regarding to, you know, health services? Is it a fact that the population of an area has got to be over 5,000 before... Uh, you know, a doctor's surgery that is, is be able to to be built in that area. I, I, it it kind of depends, Sandra. You know, the, the, there is a, a, a an indicator. Right. You know, but it's an indicator. It's not a rule per se. You know, what, what matters is um, is is the sufficient health provision in the area, given the the size and the nature of the population. Um, and that's where, coming back to Section 75 agreements, I would like to see Section 75 agreements address health needs. Because yeah. we're building, you know, and as I say, I've been involved in, for example, in Aberdeen, where there's a lot of new housing, um, but not any okay. GP facilities being built in as part of the Section 75 agreement. It seems to me that's mm -hmm. putting additional pressure on the health service elsewhere. Um, which is not very clever. So it's a good example, and John's talking about design. That's mm -hmm. a very good example of where when you're designing a new housing estate, uh, the health needs as well as the education needs uh, mm -hmm. are, are essential to look at. Thank, thank you. I may, I may write to you on that particular one with the yep. new bills that we've got in the Merchant City in Glasgow. Right, OK. <laughs> Sorry, John. No, 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 you can't tell you. I, I'm interested in these relationships, Cabinet Secretary, because clearly housing and planning are, are local authority issues, health, is, is, is a local basis to it too, but we will turn to the like of yourself, cabinet secretaries, for the overview in this. And it's yeah. uh, how are these managed together? Because of course you can provide guidance, and you don't want to get into heavy prescribing and legislative. We want people to work yes. collaboratively. How, how can we ensure that that takes place? Because you're right, as someone who sat in a planning committee, it was schools right. and other, you know, recreational facilities that were frequently considered rather well, than health. Well, the key issue, the key document is the local development plan, because that's both a planning document and, of course, core to that is the housing needs and uh, demand assessment. Uh, and I think that's actually in the past, historically, where uh, very often the success of LDPs have broken down because they've either under, well, usually underestimated the demand for housing and therefore not created enough land supply to accommodate the housing, which in turn pushes up the price of land, which in turn pushes up unnecessarily the price of housing. But the key document that brings it all together is the local development plan. Right. And you, you're not seeing any tensions there between local government and central government on the objectives of... No, not in the objectives. I mean, I, I, I'm now taking a much more critical look at LDPs um, and I'm not prepared to endorse an LDP if I think they're underestimating the demand for housing in their area because 
clearly if you speak to developers in both in you know uh, re the rental sector as well as now in the occupied sector the biggest challenge is finding the land um, and you know you represent a rural area john it's a particular problem mm -hmm. in rural mm -hmm. areas yeah. i'm grateful for that cabinet secretary yeah, thank, thank you, you. Just a little challenge on this, uh, representing Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, uh, we know the land is very, very expensive, but sometimes the local development, the problem is maybe the way we see how housing should be built, uh, which means that it could create uh, uh, problems with, with services when you have so many detach, detached houses. Are we not... In your strategy, maybe you're not thinking because we had some some people coming and telling us that it's maybe the way we design these new communities. Yes. If we design new communities that demand so much land, maybe is a wrong type of housing. Yes, is a design of the housing that we should address. Well, in actual fact, I'm very much in favour, and it's maybe easier to move towards this kind of system now that we're out of recession. I'm much more in favour of doing much more of what the Continentals do. They don't wait for the developers to come and, and designate and, and apply for a particular parcel of land. The, the local authority actually develops the land, puts in the infrastructure, and then says to the developer, which part, which chunk of this do you want to build houses on? And what type? No, and what type? And, and that it, I think you then get a much better alignment between need uh, and supply. Thank you. And that as well, and I apologise, I'll maybe come back a bit, but I just thought about it when we were talking about building sheltered accommodation um, as well. Um, it would be quite good if maybe the, the government and local authorities took into account that when you're thinking of sheltered housing, you don't build it in isolation, like you says, but also integrated so as it can bring the community from yes. that area, actually, yeah. and young people. And a good example I read was that um, in one particular area, there was young students living in the same uh, houses, the same flats as the elderly people. They get cheap rent, but part of their commitment was... They weren't to be noisy, but they were also actually to mix in and spend an hour or two with a person, yep. an elderly person in that block. Yep. Is that something the government would seriously think about as well, <coughs> integrating the, the different age groups together as well? I, I think we're seeing that more and more convener. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of older people who will not move to sheltered housing because mm -hmm. they don't want to move into what they see as an old person's ghetto, if yeah. I can use that. They don't want that. They want mm -hmm. to be part of the wider community. And I think in dealing with the, some of the challenges we're talking about this morning, you can understand why yeah. that's the case. Now, we've, we're always trying to build shelter, sheltered housing near to mm -hmm. facilities, like mm -hmm. traditionally, you know, as near as possible to the shops and the post office and things like that. Although there are so few post offices these days, it's yeah. difficult mm -hmm. to always do that. But the, the so... I think that's the case, but mm -hmm. I think a much more integrated approach mm -hmm. so that you don't have, you know, that's the old folk over there and, and sometimes it can make the older people more isolated mm -hmm. because, because of the way we design and locate the housing. So clearly that's something that we need to be much more um, proactive about in the future yeah, and making sure it doesn't happen. Yeah, one of the... the um initiatives we were supposed to go and see but because of the bad weather in Jura we couldn't actually get across was a, a housing community for the elderly but it was also a, a social hub for yeah. the whole community yes. in that area and it integrated really well so that that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about Absolutely. as well yeah, yeah. no okay. we're, I'm very keen on encouraging that kind of development yeah and that, that's probably a good model to maybe to sort of have a look at as yes, well if you're thinking about it um if I can pass on now to Jane Thanks, Convener, and just commend the Cabinet Secretary and the Convener to go to Longfinnens in Fife, and where the weather's always good, but they're building a <laughs> care village, and it incorporates some of the things that you've just been talking about, about yeah. building a sheltered environment, but not just old folks' housing. It, is, it encompasses the whole spectrum of needs of people as they get older. Yes, they don't need to yeah. move away to move into a different kind of housing, Absolutely. and you only have to go to Longfinnens to see it. But that's not what my question's about, but just um, so that for, for information... My question is about transport, Cabinet Secretary, and I was really pleased in your introductory remarks that you talked about accessible transport, and I wondered if you would like to expand a bit about what features you think contribute to making transport accessible. 
Well, I, I, I think one of the biggest problems we've got very often with public transport is that because of the routes they go around, very often, you know, older people um, have <coughs> quite a distance to walk in order to access the transport. <coughs> and I, I personally would like to see many more kind of dial-a-bus type arrangements where um, <coughs> you um, actually... It comes and picks you up at your uh, house uh, or a bus stop that's near your house. Uh, so I think there's more that we can do in, in all of this. I mean, uh, I also think, again, you know, some of the community transport uh, facilities and services that are available could be expanded. Uh, and again, you know, a lot of that's volunteers. I mean, for example, I have an organisation in my constituency in Shorts, Getting <coughs> getting Better Together is the name of the organisation. And one of the services it provides, not just for Shorts now, but for a large part of North Lanarkshire, is a, helping a patients get from their home to hospital appointments. And that's an invaluable service. Now, it's not just invaluable because of the physical need for transport, because it would take you half a day to get from Shorts to Monklands Hospital in Airdrie, not to mention the expense. But actually, again, it's bringing, because a lot of these people are elderly people, it's bringing them into contact with other people. And indeed, some of the drivers themselves are elderly retired people, and this is how they keep themselves active and involved. So I think there's a lot of scope for expanding community transport facilities right across the country. And, um, but I think that there's lots of transport providers, and some of them are in the private sector. There's probably scope to use taxis more effectively than we do, especially yes. in terms of people with disabilities often need to, to travel and yep. adapt to taxis. Yep. So there's a whole range Absolutely. of resources. Absolutely. Um, and I also agree with you when you said that the bus pass is, is a brilliant thing, but it kind of needs to be a bus <laughs> So Aye. we've got a lot of resources. Yeah. Um, some of them are publicly funded, some are not. They, they need to be coordinated. Yes. Um, do you think they are coordinated enough or at all? Is there scope for that to happen Well, obviously more? the job of the regional transport partnerships is to do that coordination. I, I mean, certainly, again, you know, in terms, say, of uh, services like health and, uh, and housing, we probably need to do a lot more joined up thinking um, in parts of the country than what actually happens at the present time. Again, particularly in rural communities, particularly isolated rural communities, um, it can be very difficult to, to access any public transport, let alone joined up public transport. So I, absolutely, I think there's a lot more that we can do um, in all of that. Health and social care integration, and again, you mentioned prevention and, and the fact that they're writing their business plans. And I'm thinking about all the resources that currently sit within health services yeah. and councils and, and the voluntary sector. And that's all about money yeah. and effective use of money and effective use of those vehicles and drivers. Do you think there's any role for strategies, perhaps through the regional transport partnerships, to, to look at? those aspects of using transport and, and, and bring that bring them closer together. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as you know, in many parts of the Highlands and Islands, it's always been the case that some public vehicles are used to transport people from one place to another because it's the only way some people can get there, whether it's a post office van or whatever. And I, I actually think, you know, we should ex expand that. So if, if the National Health... The National Health Services get fleets of uh, vehicles... And, you know, if there is scope in particular areas to make greater use of those in helping inter-hospital transfers or transfers from home to hospital of patients, then look at, let's look at how we can do that. And just about older people. Um, oh, no, no, no. Younger people need to get to work. People of all ages need to get to work. Well, Travel to work is a big isolating issue. If you absolutely. can't get to your work, then that... And it's not just about accessing worse. hospital services, but yeah. accessing a whole range of services, yeah. not least work. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And college. Yes, absolutely. OK, that's good to hear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, John Finney. Captain Secretary, a, a range of questions here on um, uh, the use of technology in the social media. And yeah. They probably fall into two, two sectors, so time's limited, and I'll just um, um, summar summarise a number of questions. Uh, the, regarding the use of technology, what, what, um, so that's technology and the, the, the social media, what benefits do you see for that? Um, for, as a, from the government's point of view, what benefits do you see for that in combating issues of isolation and indeed bullying? Well, I, I actually see huge benefits. I mean, um, <coughs> let me give you an, again an anecdotal example, but I think it exemplifies the benefits. Uh, where 
I, I, I know of a, a, an elderly lady who lives quite away from her family. Uh, her husband died, and she hadn't. She's not a big mixer in the, the local community, um, but she discovered YouTube, and and it's transformed her life because she goes on to YouTube every day and finds out what's happening locally and nationally. Uh, she looks at all sorts of different things, and uh, you know she's into uh, she's interested in sport, and she sees sport much more sport than she can access in her television, and so on and so forth. And I think that's a very very good example of where technology can be used very effectively to reduce the impact of social isolation and loneliness. Skype is another very good example. Um, I mean, ironically, one of the most easily accessible parts of Scotland for a super fast broadband is Noidart. And thanks to the work of Professor uh, Brun at uh, Edinburgh University, um, but people in Noidart uh, talking to grandchildren in New Zealand through Skype is a very good example of where you can, um, you know, reduce isolation and people are communicating without actually leaving the house. And it's particularly beneficial, obviously, for people who are housebound uh, because uh, they can access um, people, particularly when they can use things like Skype. Uh, they can actually talk to people, have conversations, keep in touch with friends and family and all the rest of it. So I actually think technology, properly used, uh, has got a fantastic contribution uh, to me. And that's why, you know, again, the rollout of super fast broadband is so important. It's not just about economic development, it's actually about dealing with some of these social issues and social challenges as well, because with super fast broadband, uh, then, which you know will be relatively cheap, it means that many people can make far greater use of the internet than currently do. And I think that will reduce isolation. Yeah, yes, indeed. And there's a, a challenge about um, accessing, you know, because um, people can feel isolated, of course, if they aren't able to access things that they're routinely here. Can I ask about the promotion of this by the, the Scottish Government? Then? Because it's been, for instance, suggested to me regarding issues like telecare, which, and, and a lot of the technology I see is positive. Yeah. Sometimes that's presented as, well, that's just trying to remove all human contact. Yeah. You know, it's seen in a cynical vein where I yeah. see it as complementary. Yeah. What role can the Scottish Government play in positively promoting? And, and also, do you have a view on... Um, I personally some knowledge and we've heard and evidence about intergenerational um, yeah. uh, schemes yeah. so you know young people teaching the older people about the benefits of Skype and all that. Yes yeah, absolutely uh, well in I mean I, I think lifelong learning and Annabelle and I were in the lifelong learning committee for some years together and we produced a report about the importance of lifelong learning right through um, you know to a uh, Whatever, it doesn't matter what age you are. You know, learning is something that's enjoyable for people. And clearly, one of the things that technology can do, whether it's Kindles or whether it's access to computers and the internet, is actually expand people's horizons in terms of lifelong learning and also give them an interest, give them something to do that they would enjoy. Uh, so all of that's extremely important. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of telehealth and telecare. Um, I think you know, it's going to transform the way in which we um, deal with patients. And uh, it's, again, a key part of how we rise to the challenges of an ageing population. Um, so I, I'm a big fan, and we're spending about £80 million a year on telehealth at the present time as a government. So it's a lot of money being invested in it. But on the back of that technology, you know, if somebody has a portal in their home as part of you know a care a, a care service or a health service, then they don't need to just restrict the use of the portal to when they're talking to the GP surgery or talking to the consultant. They can use that portal for anything. Uh, so it's a very good example of where we can expand uh, the uses of the technology uh, and do it to the benefit of people. And again, you know, be part of a preventive strategy in terms of dealing with depression, social isolation, and uh, loneliness. But you are aware of this this view, um, not widely held necessarily, but yes. by some people that this is depersonalising this. This is absolutely. this is remoteness. This is they've given me a box rather than someone chatting yeah. my door yeah. every morning. I, I, I absolutely, and I think I, what I found in my experience is that very often when people uh, start off uh, with this using this kind of technology, that's very often their approach. They're very sceptical about it. 
but very often they very quickly come round to realising the benefits of it. I mean, a very good example is in Inverness, where um, the uh, consultations with um, dementia patients who are living in areas of the Highlands which are very far from Inverness, you know, for a dementia patient to undertake a 120-mile return journey uh, to Inverness for a consultation is the worst possible thing you can do to that dementia patient. And as you know now, telehealth is being used, teleconsulting between the hospital in Inverness and the nursing home or the house where the dementia patient is living. And they actually, uh, along with you know the carer, do that consultation, monthly consultation uh, by telehealth. And it means that you know the worst thing you can do for, as I say, for a dementia patient is force them into a journey, you know, 90 miles to Inverness and 90 miles back. That is absolutely not good for them. So the benefits of telehealth and telecare are absolutely enormous, but we're not realising to them to the full extent because we can make far greater use, for example, of the portals that are installed in people's homes when they're um, involved in telehealth and telecare. And you can, are you able to give a, a, an assurance then that there's nothing that will mean there's blanket application of everything, that there will be individual need assessments and, and what's appropriate for the individual? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's how the health service works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being person-centred is a key part of the strategy. OK, many thanks, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, moving on to Christian now. Uh, during our inquiry, as I said, we got a lot of positive feedback and, and a lot of people said they were delighted with the integration of healthcare and social services. It's the same way, they were very positive and a lot of expectation is put on GearTech, get it right for, for every child. Yes. But, but, but high expectation, we'll, we need to manage it, I think, as a government. I think the Scottish government has got to, to manage it because we've got to make sure that it's just like the integration of, uh, of the services. We need to make sure that it's at strategic level, that uh, uh, social isolation is there and, yes. and, 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 and that it could be measured as well. Not only we can see the people invisible, but it can be measured. And a lot of people, like the Scottish Youth Parliament and children in Scotland, and the old uh, Youth Link, uh, they all refer to, to, to GIFACT, and they said that it should be included, social isolation should be included in the well-being indicators. Yeah, yeah. How how you see it? Are we going to put it at strategic level? Well, I, I mean that would be a decision just for me, that a wider cabinet decision. But to, I mean, I I think that's certainly a proposal worth looking at because clearly, um, the whole point of GIFFEC is that we set people up for life. You know, it's not just uh, for the years they're they're under GIFFEC; it's uh, actually preparation for the rest of their lives. And clearly, um, if we want to prevent social isolation and and all that goes with it then I think there's a good case for doing something as part of GERFEC so that um, people um, are encouraged uh, to mix and to uh, be involved in sports and communal activities and all the rest of it as part and parcel of being physically and mentally fit. And making sure maybe that, you know, we heard from, from a lot of young people who, who, who went into care and they left the care with an abrupt transition there yes. and how can we make sure that gear effect will will have will have a seamless transition into adulthood yeah have, have, you know, have we working on that making sure that socialization is addressed there but but it keeps on into, into adulthood as well well young I, I, you know as part of the overall umbrella of gear effect there's a lot of work been going on as you probably know on things like uh, cared for children i for, i mean you probably saw the other day the report on foster children and the need the, the uh, national campaign to recruit uh, 750 more uh, foster parents so all of these aspects are all part and parcel of the GERFEC, uh, umbrella of GERFEC, looking at how, because we do know, obviously, looked after children um, are the most vulnerable in terms of getting into a life of crime. Once they're 16, you know, the transition into alternative accommodation and transition into the world of work um, is, is particularly challenging. They tend to be well under underrepresented in terms of college and university education and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of work going on in all of these areas. Just to conclude, there are a lot of, as you say, challenges. Yes. Uh, I will, we heard from a lot of people regarding that national campaign. I, there was a 
feeling that it was important that my campaign will not concentrate on the challenges, but concentrate on the positive example, yes. things which really work very well. So I don't know if you see a national campaign on that side. Well, I, th I think, yeah, you know, as well as the, the challenges, I think we've also got to be honest when we try something and it doesn't work because you have to learn the lessons of that as well. You know, and I think we should be perfectly open and say, look, there are some things we'll try that it won't work. But let's not jump down each other's throats because we've tried them. I think, you know, we've got to be innovative. And by definition, if you're going to be innovative and risk-taking, some of those innovations, some of those risks won't pay off. But you learn from that. So we learn about what works and what doesn't work. And I think that's extremely important to Christian because clearly, I, I mean... People are coming from all over the world to see the work we're doing with Gerfec. I mean, it is a trailblazing way of dealing with the challenges of young people and preparing them for tomorrow's world. And I think, you know, you've got to be um, honest about the failures as well as the successes and learn from the failures. Thank you. Can I come in briefly on that? Um, listen to... Um, you speaking about Gerfec, and I feel as if this is a really, really powerful tool yeah. that we actually have that we can actually use. When we were in Easter House, um, we heard that there is that there was um, two children, two two young people, who actually I think it was one or two of them spoke with American accents, and the reason for that being was that they were social isolated right. and lonely, and they didn't interact with their peers. They went to school, then they went home and they sat the whole time on the computers. So they picked up these accents from the games uh, they were actually playing. And I think if Gerfec is used properly, then this has given uh, us the opportunity to actually reach out to every single young person, right, and prevent them from going through this period of social isolation yeah. and loneliness because there is, and we also heard from a group or an organisation who went out into the streets to try to and speak to people, to try to connect with young people who were isolated, yeah. who didn't come up on the radar through social services, through the schools or whatever. And that's the same problem I've actually got with the people at the other end of the scale, the elderly people yes. who don't go to the doctors, who don't join social clubs yeah. or whatever. And we've got that hidden possibly 10% sitting there as well. So GERFIC is, I think, a really good indicator of early intervention. Yeah. And it'd be really useful and good if the government would consider using this really effectively to target these young people as well. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's absolutely right, Convene. And again, I think that's something that maybe the committee will want to recommend. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you take children, for example, we do know that um, a period of transition for children can be particularly challenging, mm -hmm. whether it's going from nursery education into primary school yeah. or from primary school into secondary school or mm -hmm. from secondary school into higher or further education. Mm -hmm. These transitional periods are very often when they are at their most vulnerable because yeah. of the changes in their life. Similarly, if they lose a parent, mm -hmm. that's going to be a very challenging period. Or if they're failing at school, mm -hmm. that also can lead to a feeling of isolation. Uh, or if they have a disability, uh, mm -hmm. particularly a learning disability. Yeah. You know, so there are certain circumstances where it's very clear we know already the, we need to intervene mm -hmm. in, in these circumstances. But there are probably many other circumstances where we're not picking it up and we need to do mm -hmm. more in terms mm -hmm. of picking it up. And I think GERFEC, under the umbrella of GERFEC, mm -hmm. is absolutely the right place yeah. to do it. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Does anyone have any more brief questions they'd like to ask the Cabinet Secretary before we wind up? No? No? Okay. Cabinet Secretary, can I thank you for coming along today? Pleasure. It's been a very enjoyable and informative session. And that officially concludes the public part of today's meeting. Um, and again, I'm not in top form this morning. Um, uh, we have got quite a few questions that we, through time constraint, we have, haven't actually had the opportunity to ask you, but we will write to you. Um, if that's okay. And Absolutely. Thank you. And our next meeting will take place on Thursday, the 18th of June. And I now suspend the meeting for the committee to move into private session. Thank Great. you again. Thank, thank you thank very you. much indeed, convener.